Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at researching anomalous cognition. My guest, Dr. Ed May, is the co-author of the book, Anomalous Cognition, Remote Viewing, Research, and Theory. He is also the co-editor of a uh, two-volume series called Extrasensory Perception, Support, Skepticism, and Science. And he is the co-author of ESP Wars, East and West. For more than a decade, he was the uh, director of the scientific program popularly known as Stargate, America's psychic spying program, and has published well over a hundred research articles in the context of that program, some of which I think are still classified, many of which have uh, become public at this point. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Jeffrey. Nice to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You coined the term anomalous cognition. I did, and I'll tell you why. All right. Um, clearly, everybody knows it as extrasensory perception. Or remote viewing. Or remote. Well, or but clairvoyance. The, yeah, or, but, the, but the interesting thing, extra, extra yeah. sensory, first of all, it says it's a sensory system. Yeah. Secondly, it says it's extra. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether that's true. There's a lot of theoretical baggage right. hidden in that Exactly. Term. And yeah. what I wanted to do as a scientist is to try to find as neutral a term as possible. Mm -hmm. What happens in extrasensory perception or remote viewing or however you want to name it, mm -hmm. people become aware of stuff. You're right. That's called a cognition. You become aware of things. Yeah. And currently, we don't know how that works. It's mm -hmm. an anomaly. Mm -hmm. So that's why we came up with the term anomalous cognition. So it's a very neutral term that would, I suppose, uh, make it more acceptable for scientific purposes. I hope so. And, mm -hmm. and for me, it does, for sure. Yeah. And uh, other people have uh, used the term as well at this point. It's caught on, much to my I'm amazement and surprise and pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when, it first, when I first published it, I was attacked. <laughs> Why are you changing the nomenclature? Nobody will know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, it worked. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, nevertheless, at, at, at base, we're talking about parapsychology. Of course we are. And even even that term, I know, has a certain amount of theoretical baggage. I think it makes my skin crawl, but that's a different issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know your hope uh, eventually is that this will simply become part of psychology and part of our understanding of normal cognition. Yes. Uh, I don't like to limit it to just psychology. This mm -hmm. is a multidisciplinary problem. Mm -hmm. It has to do with physics. How does the information get from over there now, then to here now? Yep. Big physics problem. Yep. Uh, what are the psychology? What are the spiritual viewpoints of people? Mm -hmm. All the human issues that make us rich wonderful beings with wide diversity, mm -hmm. all that comes to play. And we can't just say, well, it's just psychology, it's just physiology, it's just whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of the two. Yeah. Makes the research difficult. Yeah. Well, there are some people who think that extrasensory perception, or whatever you want to call it, will forever remain outside the domain of science. I completely disagree with that. It's already in the domain of science. Mm -hmm. um, it has been for over 100 years. Sure. I think uh, the real research started with the uh, Society for Psycho Research London, correct, mm -hmm. in 1982. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you're aware of what's interesting about the SPR in London. They published a quarterly journal since 18, I think, 86 when they started it, have not missed a quarter even through the war, war, two world wars, and yeah. they're still working at it. It's brilliant. Yeah. There's, the literature in, in the field is vast. Yes. But now you, in, in researching it, have made an, a number of uh, interesting modifications to the uh, methodology, and that's what we want to focus on now. Sure. Um, Part of the issue is, what? how do you define extrasensory perception, mm -hmm. to start with? If you want to research something, it'd be nice to have a definition. Yeah. And already up front, we have a problem. Because mm -hmm. the general definition of extrasensory perception, there are two of them. One is what we call operational definition. It's mm -hmm. kind of ritualistic. Yeah. If we do this ritual, what we get out of that ritual will just label extrasensory mm -hmm. perception. That tells you absolutely nothing about ESP, how it works or anything. 
the, it's just an observable. Right. In other words, what you end up with is a statistical anomaly. Right. Mm -hmm. Another op another definition is one more com commonly used, and that is a negative def definition. Mm -hmm. ESP happen is what happens when nothing else should have mm -hmm. outside our sensory range. Right. And that's a crummy definition because uh, negative definitions also don't tell you about what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'll make a geeky statement. Please excuse my language here. Um, I will go to the mat defending the following position. There's incontrovertible evidence for an information transfer anomaly we currently do not understand. Mm -hmm. Notice that doesn't even bring ESP into the question. Yeah. And that I will go to defend. Mm -hmm. And if someone asks me, do I believe in ESP? I will say, I don't know what it is. How can I yeah. believe in something that I don't understand? But you called it information transmission. Yeah, transfer. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that seems pretty clear. I mean, you have a target and yeah. then you have uh, a report from a percipient mm -hmm. yes. uh, that matches the target. So information somehow got from the target to the percipient. Okay, let's start and let's deconstruct all that. Yeah. First of all, you have to have a target. Yeah. And so what constitutes an ESP target? We have 40 man years worth of effort at the Stargate program developing that system. Mm -hmm. And it's fairly complex. I mean, if you have an out, a, a site outside that's going to be a target, mm -hmm. and having been a judge in those kinds of circumstances, mm -hmm. we wander to the site and say, where does it end? Where does it begin? Mm -hmm. Take an example. If it's a real life situation. It's a real life situation. situation like sort. Hoover Tower on the Stanford campus. Mm -hmm. Well, does it, anything, if I climb to the top of the tower and look out, anything I see, does that count? Mm -hmm. Or is it 50 meters away? Those are really difficult questions. Mm -hmm. So what we did was to move away from natural sites right. to photographs. Mm -hmm. And then we got really rigorous about it. Mm -hmm. Let's take a picture of the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Everybody knows there's water at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but if it's not in that photograph, it is not part of that target. Mm -hmm. So it, we were really tight because we're trying to figure out how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, it we'll give you credit for saying water, well, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not there because uh -huh. it's not in the photograph. But you've already taken a, a real life target, which uh, is, is an experience someone can immerse themselves in. It has yep. smells, it has sounds, it has right. colors, it has emotions, and uh, reduced it down to something that might be less attractive to people, a photograph. Um, that's a good hypothesis to have, mm -hmm. but the data say that's not true. Uh, interesting. We got much better results that way uh -huh. because we could clear away noise. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we humans are great about making stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> and there, this allows people to say, look, um, none of our targets include smells, mm -hmm. none of them include a whole long list of stuff, and we inform our people about what it's not in general in the target system. Mm -hmm. Why? When we have dialogue, normal communication, we all do internal self-editing. Yeah. You know, as humans, you know, we're having this discussion, you and I, and I'm thinking, well, is it time for lunch yet? I'm not going to mention that to you. <laughs> it's not part of it. So I do, right. we all do self-internal right. editing. Of course. Why would I not allow ESP research, uh, recipients to also do internal editing in the same sort of way? What we try to do in the research is to demystify the process. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you're hungry or just had a fight with your spouse or you're out of money, yeah. I don't want you to be in this lab right now because you couldn't balance your checkbook correctly. Why do I think you'd be a good ESP recipient? What well, do you screen people? We ask them, yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, it got us in trouble in the government program. Someone would fly across the country at great expense. A person would walk in the door and say, you know, Go to the beach. You need a time off to relax. Mm -hmm. And our government reminders would go crazy. Hey, yeah. we're paying for this. Yeah. And I would say, do you want to check boxes or do you want to have good results? Mm -hmm. And when you allow people to, you know, uh, do it right. This is not mystical. This is normal psychology. Mm -hmm. And I don't even, I'm not even a psychologist. <laughs> but you're dealing with a delicate phenomenon. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not like uh, uh, some tasks. Uh, I could be in a terrible mood and still perform the task well. Well, I'll give you one example of that. Uh, a well-known, uh, the late Hella Hammond mm -hmm. and I were being towed in a submarine off, off of, of um, uh, Catalina Island. I on remember the that experiment. And she was seasick. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, are you all right? And she says, if you say that one more time, we're going to throw up all over you. <laughs> <laughs> and she did fantastic remote viewing of that circumstance. Yeah. 
you know, in our in the field of parapsychology, there's something called psi conducive setting, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is because uh, I've been at an army base where they were doing remote viewing, and I'm sitting there as a judge, and I'm and all of a sudden I hear the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life because the remote viewing lab was about a uh, oh, hundred yards from a howitzer range, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hear kaboom, and mm -hmm. I lift off my chair that oh, far. Oh, oh, oh. You're going to do remote viewing here? Yeah. That's not exactly psi conducive. Right. Uh, another example, um, we did uh, mm -hmm. remote viewing of the planets of the moons of Jupiter. Yes. And we had to be at the middle of the night, so my um, our uh, remote viewer and I would go to Denny's restaurant and over hot fudge Sundays at three in the morning do fantastic remote viewing. Why in the middle of the night? Because we were trying to ask the musical question. If you can remote view the moons of Jupiter, uh, and Io goes around Jupiter every three hours. Mm -hmm. And we wanted the, the remote viewer to tell us when the moon was half lit going through the shadow of Jupiter. Oh, okay. And so we had to have a very accurate timing and we arranged that a telescope at a local college was making those measurements for us. Uh -huh. So, you know, Jupiter moons were doing I the see. timing. Uh -huh. And what I wanted to do is to ask the question between would the viewer do it in Earth-based time or Jupiter-based time? And mm -hmm. in this case, it was 40 minutes difference. So we had about an hour and a half where we do this remote viewing. In other words, it takes light 40 minutes to arrive. Exactly. From Jupiter. Exactly. Uh -huh. So what would you guess was the answer? We got stunning results from that. Jupiter-based time. How do you know that was right? Well, I, it, that would be the more surprising <laughs> That's uh, what happened. result. Our remote viewer was sitting you know, at the vacation cabin mm -hmm. on Jupiter and watching. In, in other words, the speed of light was not an obstacle. Absolutely not. Now, the question becomes, and this is a huge research issue, which we've yet to uh, solve, from where did the, did the viewer get that information? Mm -hmm. What you just said is assuming they got it in real time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, at a day later, I'm showing, the first name of the guy is Gary, I'm showing him the results. Mm -hmm. He could have gotten it from then, had nothing to do with Jupiter. Well, by precognition. How would he, uh, by precognition, know the exact moment? Well, he wouldn't, but he's looking at his graph, yeah. and that could tell him. I see. In fact, part of the, our research that has come out of this is uh, trying to address the question, when, where, and how long mm -hmm. Psi operates. Mm -hmm. Those are three still huge mysteries of which we don't have an answer to. Well, I know you have developed a hypothesis, an important one, that that the main modality of this information transmission is uh, retrocausal, backwards through time. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we hypothesize, and a lot of our, our colleagues do not like this at all, mm -hmm. that in informational form of psi, as opposed to mentally moving things around psychokinesis, yeah. we think it's all pre precognition. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we can't close the answer book. We don't know how to close the future. Right. Let me give you an example. I know a telepathy experiment that can actually prove telepathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jeffrey, I'm thinking of a number between one and a million. What is it? Uh, 334,926. I take out my service revolver and shoot myself in the head, carry to my grave that that was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> there is no place where you could have gotten it other ways than out of my mind. That's the only uh -huh. way I can pr pr prove for sure mm -hmm. that telepathy exists. Uh -huh. If I write down, tell anybody else, write it down in any book, it could have come from some other source. That doesn't mean it did, yeah. but um, I like Occam's mm -hmm. razor. I say frequently with it. Um, the, <laughs> the problem is we can show that precognition works in the laboratory. Uh -huh. And so if it works in the laboratory, meaning we uh, generate a target after the response is given, right. then if that works, uh, and I'm going to have an answer book to show you later. At least that pathway is still open. Maybe mm -hmm. there's others that will yeah. be there. And so why, if I have to invent a, a new theory for telepathy and clairvoyance and survival and all these wonderful mm -hmm. things we all love, and I can reduce all that to only one impossible thing, precognition, mm -hmm. I think we've made advances. Well, that, that's a very interesting and, and stimulating approach. I'm sure you know it raises all kinds of paradoxes. Uh, yes, and anger. <laughs> 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 Tell me a paradox. Well, if people are able to uh, obtain information from the future, it mm -hmm. suggests that somehow the future has already occurred, but the future hasn't occurred. Ah, we can resolve that paradox. Uh -huh. um, 
science fiction uh, world and popular movies at all say that if you can see the future, in some sense you're condemned to experience that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're great themes um, mm -hmm. about trying to avoid this psychic dream you've had and at the end of the day you can't do it. Right. Okay, so we, we somebody paid us to actually look at that philosophically mm -hmm. and we did the world's most boring experiment, which I won't bother you with, but the outcome was can you see probable futures mm -hmm. even though they don't actually occur yeah. or can you, are you always in precognition to only see those actions that mm -hmm. actually do occur? The answer, fortunately, because it unveils us of all those paradoxes, yeah. you can see probable futures whether they occur or not. Well, that's what excites me so much about parapsychology <laughs> is the philosophical implications. I know. That's what's so important about this. People ask, why bother? It's a tiny effect. It's hard to see. No one believes you. Why should you spend any time on it? Because mm -hmm. it addresses those philosophical issues. It addresses uh, uh, psychophysiology. We may learn something about the brain. We may learn something about spirituality. Mm -hmm. We may even learn something about physics at the end yeah. of the day. All those things are worthy of continuing the work. Now, I want to go back to another issue you raised earlier. On the one hand, you said it's important to screen the percipients mm -hmm. in, in your experiments so that if they're having a bad day, you don't force them to perform an experiment. On the other hand, you imply that the best percipients do very well under terrible conditions. Right. But if someone flies across the country and they're sneezing and have cold and sick, yeah. sorry, we don't need to do that. Because mm -hmm. you can't ba balance a checkbook or tie your shoes properly in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Why would you expect them to do that? Maybe they rise to the occasion, like you suggested, in a critical experiment, I mean, if, or critical study. Uh, we have a kidnapped victim, where are they? Mm -hmm. Or a lost person, where are they? Yeah. They will rise above it, but generally not very well. But doesn't it also raise the issue of uh, that some people are just much more talented than others? Oh, well, isn't that true of every other talent you can think of? It is. Okay, mm -hmm. I can make a noise on a violin that'll clear an entire auditorium, and no, all the training in the world would never get me to be Yasha Heifetz on mm -hmm. stage. Right. So why would you not allow ESP to be that same way? Mm -hmm. Everybody probably has a little bit, some have a little more, and a very small group of people are really top of the line. And you, in, in your research, have managed to find this small group of people. Yeah. Uh, if you want to study a talent, mm -hmm. I mean, there are two really sort of dichotomous questions, both of which are important. One is, how is ESP ability distributed in the population at large? That's a good question to ask. Mm -hmm. And you should not focus your attention on experts. Yeah. You should just drag people in off the street and mm -hmm. test them. But if you're more interested in how it works, you should find people that can repeatedly demonstrate it under laboratory conditions. Mm -hmm. If you include me in a study of high jumping, I'll distort the statistics and lead you astray because <laughs> I will never jump that high off yeah. the ground. Yeah. And so that's why we worked with this. What's interesting in terms of human research, we've worked with some of the same people for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So they, they are heroes in my view because they're willing to put up with us for all that period of time yeah. because they are as curious about how, what is happening to them as we are. Mm -hmm. and, and what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that with these highly talented people who you worked with over and over and over again for 30 years, their talent level stayed about the same. It didn't decline or get better. Yeah, that's frustrating. I mean, we have no decline effect in our data at all. Mm -hmm. And I think I know why. We come back to that. The frustrating part practice does not make better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of variants. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Yeah. And you say, well, what's what's the regression line? What is the average? Mm -hmm. It The slope is zero to two decimal places. They do not get better. Mm -hmm. That's frustrating. And what that says to me, um, you know, in the visual system, we have what is called the uh, visual acuity. Yes. That's not your perception. It's how the hardware in your eyes work. Mm -hmm. And you can't improve that. You can put on glasses, but it still doesn't <laughs> improve your visual acuity. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're talking about remote viewing visual acuity here. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Something that means we can't improve it. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a measure of our, our knowledge and really quite uh, frustrating that we haven't been able to see an incline. Yeah. Um, um, now, another thing I understand with regard to the military intelligence program, in the, in the early days when Hal Putoff was running the program, mm -hmm. before you became the director, uh, one of the ways that he kept the funding going is that every time a, a military contractor came to visit the laboratory and see what's going on, he'd ask them 
uh, inexperienced as they were to be re remote viewers, and they were, I guess, pretty consistently successful. Yeah, and that was brilliant on his part. Uh -huh. He deserves infinite credit for that. That was uh -huh. terrific. Did you employ that strategy yourself? I, well, I did it in a different way. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, remote viewer on our project. I can name him. His name is Nevin Lance. He's mm -hmm. a PhD psychologist, yeah. and he was in charge of all the psychology of our program, and he was one crackerjack remote viewer. Mm -hmm. So someone like from uh, that would come from DIA, senior officials, I would say, okay, Nevin, you're, you're um, you know, the demo remote viewer, mm. but I would make the officials do the judging. Okay. And they would nail it. Mm -hmm. And then that, you have to own it when they do that. Yeah. But not the viewer. Not the viewer. I, didn't, I wouldn't do that. For that me. was too risky. Yeah, from my point of view. Honestly. But Hal deserves credit for that. That was brilliant on his mm -hmm. half. Well, what it shows is is that uh, a an unprepared, unselected person can do very well in some circumstances. Lucky. It's really lucky. Mm -hmm. What we find, one of the research things that we were asked to find out, how is super talent distributed the population? Mm -hmm. The net net of that, with a lot of money and a lot of effort to look into it, about one person in a hundred will have the kind of remote viewing skill that Joe McMonagall has. Mm. That's pretty crummy. On the other hand, you know, one percent of the world population is an awful lot of Joe McMonagalls. Yeah. yeah, no, one in a hundred isn't bad. Not I, at all. I would <laughs> say for uh, for that kind of talent, I would have thought his talent was even more rare. No, and what's fascinating about that is we have some techniques we've developed in research to find them. Mm -hmm. So you know quite a bit about how to screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the bad news is, and we'll probably get into this later, I suppose, uh, we looked at every possible way you can examine a human being and see if it would be predictive of side performance. Yeah. It does not. And that's really frustrating. So, you know, yeah, so I, I'm assuming that what you're going to say then is side performance itself predicts side performance. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what a pain that is. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, well, that makes it simple in a way. Well, no, it does it. You know, um, I had a project, we had to look at something like 300 people mm -hmm. to try to answer this question. Mm -hmm. There's an amusing story there. Um, I uh, put out a flyer at Stanford Research, at SRI International, yeah. saying, well, we're having a brown bag lunch, I come to the auditorium, and the whole network within SRI lit up negatively. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, we thought we got rid of those guys, what are we doing this witchcraft stuff? Oh, yeah. And the leader of that ring sat in the front row with his arms crossed like this, ready to go after me. Mm -hmm. He did the best in the room. <laughs> 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 and he says, he, he's an artificial intelligence guy, yeah. and he said, this is nonsense. And I said, no, no, we're coming into the lab, we're gonna do a formal test. Mm -hmm. he, he did well, and he's still one of my pri private remote viewer guys. Mm -hmm. He still doesn't believe it. Well, speaking of the potential to integrate this into mainstream science yeah. it would, and artificial intelligence, it would seem that if you can uh, understand the uh, mechanisms behind anomalous cognition, sure. then one ought to be able to program a computer to do it. Ah, interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, I've spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union in Russia. Yeah. And one of the major people there is uh, Yuri uh, uh, Vasilyevich Goryaev. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a senior official in the Russian Academy of Sciences. He is, uh, uh, to quote him, he speaks English quite well, uh, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Mm -hmm. What he means by that, he's been nominated 12 times for a Nobel Prize mm -hmm. and never gotten one. Mm -hmm. I was talking to him about some of the physics stuff that we're, we left. He says, oh my gosh, I want you to come to my lab because we can build a psychic chip. Mm -hmm. If that's true, yeah. I'm kind of skeptical, but it would be worth a shot at it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'd like one on my phone, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe uh, 100, 200 years from now, yep. uh, that will become commonplace. And people will look back on this interview and say, why didn't they realize? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can tell me the secrets now, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> Through precognition. That's it. Uh -huh. uh, one of the serious things that comes out of this research, I think, is that we have some, some, oh, I would say loose definitions of who are likely to be good. Mm -hmm. I think people, I'm interested in that anyway. Yeah. Um, and that is, if someone is not preoccupied, students make lousy remote viewers mm -hmm. because, oh, you know, where's my job when the next exam comes? Yeah. People who, on the average, are satisfied with their station in life, regardless of what that station in life is, mm -hmm. they tend to be very, very good at their job. Mm -hmm. And the other thing uh, is that uh, people who do well in strange circumstances, whatever uh, 
place you can find. Uh, there are salespeople who are masters at their craft, yeah. and you tie them down and say, well, I'm not sure why I'm interviewing that person, but I just knew that was the right mm -hmm. answer. And the way we found Joe McMonagle was that the Army had a uh, managerial problem in the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. Men in those days would go on patrol, and the poor guy out in front was called the point man, right. and all the enemy was aiming at him. Yeah. So they had lifetime uh, life expectancies of those guys. High attrition rates. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. And there were a few, I hate to use the term wizards, who were mm -hmm. really good, and troops decided they wouldn't go out on patrol patrol unless, unless they were one of these wizards. And Joe was one of these. He was one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And so the Army came to us and said, are they psychic? We said, no, they're not. They're environmentally more sensitive, better trained, mm -hmm. they've got better hearing, blah, blah, blah. And well, some of them turned out to be mighty damn psychic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, I think our viewers might want to ask themselves if they know people like that. Well, I'm sure they will. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a big secret. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Ed May, our time uh, is almost up. It goes very quickly. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I know you have a lot more to say about the v various correlations of anomalous cognition, and yes. I'm very happy to uh, let our viewers know we will do some more interviews to, to go into even more depth on these fascinating problems. I look forward to it, Jeffrey. Thank you for being with me, Ed. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.